Acts 14 and 15, a lot of places we could go. But in these two chapters, um, here's what I want to point out. We talk about Paul a lot as being a soul winner, and he most certainly was a great example on winning souls. And uh, he gave his life to that, no doubt about that. Uh, it was his mission, which Christ had given the church, really, a mission to uh, preach the gospel. And, uh, and so we think about Paul when it comes to just soul winning. We think about his life. But actually, if you follow his, his life and you follow his ministry, and he, he was concerned about the entire Great Commission, more than just winning, winning people to the Lord. But you see, he, he had a vision, I think, to follow up. And as we see there in Acts 14 and Acts 15, as it was already read, you see that he would go and his job was he wanted to confirm the churches, you know, make sure they understood, right. firm them up on a few things. Uh, and you know as well as I do that you could lead somebody to the Lord today and you could go back next week or even tomorrow. And a lot of times you're going to find people that they aren't sure on some things. Right. And it might drive you crazy because you're like, I thought we made this really clear the other day. But for different reasons, you know, they just they might not have gotten it. So we realize that Paul was all about the Great Commission. He not only, uh, you know, with the Bible talks about how he didn't really go around baptizing. That wasn't really his ministry so much. But we do follow the ministry where many people got baptized after they were saved all throughout. You know, I looked at that to see because, you know, there's some different theories that go out there, some different doctrines regarding baptism. And sometimes they say like early on in the ministry, uh, at the beginning of Acts, people are getting saved and, and immediately baptized. But then towards the end, some people believe we don't even need to baptize anymore. Like that's not for us anymore. But you follow the entire book of Acts and all the way up to the end, people that get saved are following it up in baptism. Like that was a way to kind of confirm them, you know, talking to them, making sure they believe what they said they believe. And then he's, and he's following it up with a baptism, a public statement, you know, and then talking to them, no doubt. And ultimately what, they would, what the goal was is to set elders over all those groups of people where they met. So he's establishing churches. And setting up preachers over those churches. And guess what they're doing? Uh, what their job is to go out and do the same thing that he was doing. Right? So this is what making disciples is all about. And so I want to talk about this follow-up. Uh, we've talked about follow-up before. And that's why I said a follow-up on follow-up. Because I just feel like, uh, you know, my own personal self, like I got these great ideas about, you know, making sure that we follow up on some people and haven't actually been able to implement it like I'd like to. So... Uh, you know, eventually we'll sit down, uh, Brother uh, Justin and I, and we'll, we'll come up with some kind of concrete plan here. Hopefully by the end of the message, you'll see what, uh, where we sit, stand so far. So number one, when we lead somebody to the Lord, or we try to, when we go door knocking, our goal is to lead them to the Lord, but we might follow up on these three different types of people. And you see there on the notes that I passed out, uh, three different sections. If we were going to go back to a house that we had knocked on last week, you know, it's pretty much just three options. You're going to go back and you're going to find somebody who is, you know is not saved, right? You know when you left the house, that person didn't get saved. But, you know, uh, there's different reasons for that, which I'll get to. We might find somebody, I'm not sure. I've had a lot of people say, you know, I'd like somebody to go back and talk to that person because, you know, maybe they said a prayer even or they seem to uh, say that they were saved, and, and, and I kind of think they were saved, but they just seemed like they had some questions or something puzzling about them. And so I would like to go, somebody to go back and follow them up. Or the third thing is somebody who you know was saved. You're pr quite confident that they were saved. They gave the right answers. They were sure of it, uh, and, and you understand that they're saved. <coughs> so let's look at the first group of people. When we leave, uh, when we leave, and a person is unsaved, and we say, well, you know, who should we go back to and who shouldn't we go back to? So number one, two types of people who aren't, uh, we, we know when we left the door, they're probably not saved. Number one, the, are people who rejected the gospel, just outright rejected it. Anybody ever got somebody like that? All right. The majority probably, if you get a chance to give them that, they, they just outright reject it, right? It's sad, but... These people, they made their choice. You know, these people decided, uh, and, and you know, some of them have 
have just even said, that makes sense to me. I understand where you're coming from. And then you ask them, well, do you believe that? Nope. <laughs> what in the world, you know? But they made that choice, okay? So how do we follow up on that kind of person? We don't. <laughs> that person made their choice. And the Bible makes it pretty clear uh, what we're supposed to do uh, when somebody just outright rejects the gospel. Now, that doesn't mean they're reprobate. There might be still a chance somebody will come back a second time, Lord, do a work on their heart, and they might still get saved. But a lot of people just flat out reject the gospel. Look at Matthew chapter 12, 31. Matthew 12, 31. You ever heard somebody uh, preaching a repent of your sins type gospel and you say, no, the Bible teaches that you're, it's only by believing, you know, trusting in Jesus. And, 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 and the only repentance is like turning from unbelief and turning to belief. Have you ever had somebody say this? Uh, well, but is an unbelief a sin? <laughs> Have you heard that before? But is an unbelief a sin? They got to turn from that sin, right? Okay, I'll give you that. There's one sin that's unforgivable, and that is not is rejecting Christ. That's unbelief, right? Rejecting him. Unforgivable, right? If you reject Christ, uh, reject the, the prompting of the Holy Spirit, it's unforgivable. Now, it doesn't mean like the first time somebody says, no, I don't want to believe that, that they're going to go to hell. But I'm saying ultimately, what's going to get a person uh, guaranteed to go to hell is they rejected Christ. Am I right? So it's any other sin, you name it, is forgivable. Now, you'll say, well, what about, you know, those who accept the mark of the beast? You know, that's in the Bible, and it says none of those people are going to be saved, right? right. Well, guess what? That person, I guarantee, has already rejected Christ. Right. And so, you know, they, they're just going to do whatever they can to save themselves. What about people who, uh, uh, you know, add to or take away from the Bible? The Bible has a few verses about that, right? Whoever adds, takes away from his word, he'll blot their name out of the book of life and all that. Well, guess what? This is going to happen among those who have rejected Christ. Why do they want to tamper with the Word of God? Why do they want to trick people and deceive them into thinking the Bible says something whenever it doesn't say that? These people are already reprobate in their mind, right? They're not, they've rejected the gospel. So there's only one sin, ultimately, that's unforgivable, and that is blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Now, I will grant, and some people say well, it's a little bit more than what I'm saying. It's actually when a person, you know, really... Uh, well, here's, let's, let's read it. Matthew 12, 31. It talks about blaspheming the Holy Ghost or speaking a word against Him. Matthew 12, 31 says, Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Neither make a tree good and his fruit good, or else make a tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. And so, I mean, I could preach an entire message on that, but that's not my goal right now. But here's what I'm trying to say. There are some people who, here, here, here's what I believe, the Bible makes it clear, comparing Scripture with Scripture. Every time... Jesus is preached and the gospel is given, right? What we're doing is through the Holy Spirit lifting Jesus up, right? When he died on the cross, uh, he did, he paid the price where, by which all people can be saved, but not everybody understands that. So somebody has to go preach the gospel to them. And when we preach Jesus, what we're doing is lifting up Jesus. And he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. The moment we preach the gospel to somebody, the Holy Spirit begins drawing in their heart. I believe that. Pricks their heart, works on their conscience, and you got people like the Apostle Paul who he said, you know, why kickest thou against the pricks? What it is is he had heard that. He had, he had heard Stephen. He stood there and witnessed him while he was preaching the gospel. And, uh, and I believe that Jesus, uh, through the Holy Spirit, was working in his heart. And so had he decided... I don't know what, I must have eaten some bad pizza or something. Were they eating pizza in that day? I don't know. I must have eaten some bad pizza or something, man. I don't know what this, you know, this conscience is that I'm getting, but I refuse that, right? 
rejected the Holy Spirit, he wouldn't have ever gotten saved. But what he did was he finally acknowledged and he, and he, and he went with that prompting of the Holy Spirit and he believed it. And so uh, I believe that's the case. When we preach the gospel and somebody flat out rejects it. Now, I'm not talking about somebody that says, you know, let me think about that. That's a lot. I've, ha I've had to leave a lot of houses where they said, man, that's a lot to take in. I want to just think that through. Or maybe read that up on myself, search these things and see if they're true. Maybe ask some uh, friends, some preachers or whatever and see if, and, uh, and you know, you never know what's going to happen after that. But you've done your best to present the gospel and to get them saved. So when somebody, though, is right in your face saying, I don't believe that, you know, there's really no point probably in trying to go back another time. Just let the Holy Spirit begin, I mean, continue to work on them if he's going to. And at what point he gives that person over to a reprobate mind, I don't know what that is. Uh, but his, it's on his own hands because he rejected, he rejected the Lord. And so uh, actually, uh, the Bible has a lot to say about that. Jesus said this about those type of people. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 6, Give not that which is holy unto dogs. Whoa, that sounds pretty judgmental. And, and you know, how are you going to know who's a dog or who's not a dog? You got to judge, right? Uh, give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine. Well, if you called somebody a pig back in those days or a dog, that was some pretty offensive stuff because those were unclean beasts. But Jesus is saying, hey, there are some people you can't even continue to. to devote all your time to right why lest they trample thee under their feet trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you mark 6 11 says this and whosoever shall not receive you remember he sent out 70 out to go take the gospel uh and he says whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you when ye depart thence shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that day. Look, I get no pleasure in sending somebody to hell. <laughs> We're not sending them to hell, but you know what I mean. Sometimes I do feel like that. We've knocked on doors before when we walk away and I'm thinking, we may have just caused that person to be turned over to a reprobate mind because they heard that gospel the last time and they said, nope, I'm going to refuse that. And we don't, we don't, you know, we certainly don't want to do that. But look, if you don't preach them to the gospel, preach them the gospel, you're never going to know. The blood's on your hands at that point, right? And so we've got to take the gospel to everybody, give them a chance to receive that or not receive that. But when they, when they outright refuse to believe it, look, don't, don't let that bother you. I know it's sad. You don't want anybody, especially if it's family members or somebody you love. But you got to just move on. They, they've made their choice. Okay, so how do we reach, how do we follow up on that person? Well, that's the one group of people we're not interested in following up on. Okay, they don't hate them. I'll, I'll hope that they're not reprobate and they're going to, you know, you know uh, I'll get to this in a minute, but you hope that somebody else is going to knock on their door or somebody else that they know is going to give them the gospel and they'll say, you know what, I better think about this again. You know, it happens. It happens all the time. So I'm not saying give up on them. I'm just saying let's not spend our time going after those people. All right, so... Uh, Number two group. No, no. Okay, here's another group of people who you know that they weren't saved when you left the door. And that's this. These are people who are confused or unable, unable to comprehend what you're telling them. We were knocking uh, doors. Uh, Brother Stevie and I were on a team. And I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident. It was Brother Stevie and I. And the lady uh, actually reminded me of a pretty big population in Iola. And I remember afterwards, he was like, what do you even do at a door like that? And what it was is this lady just wasn't getting it. I mean, everything, he, he was trying to be as simple and as clear as he could. And her mind would just go off some totally different direction. And it's like, well, we're not talking about that right now. Well, will you pray for me? I'm sick. <laughs> you know, and it's like, yeah, yeah, but, but how about your soul? Are you going to heaven? <laughs> I mean, it was just like, it was super, super hard. It's just like she's not getting it. And there are sometimes... I would think everybody in here has a personality or a way of thinking that somebody is not going to, it's not going to click. You're not going to be able to get through to them. But maybe another one of us could, you know. I told him, I said, I actually, that's a lot of the people in the houses that we knock in and Iola, you know, maybe that would have been a house, for example, 
that I'm used to that, ty that type of thinking. Maybe I would have been able to talk to them a little better. But you understand, sometimes another person could go with the same message and the person gets it. But sometimes you're talking to somebody after 20, 30 minutes, you're like, this person doesn't have a clue what I'm trying to say. So you, so you just set a good example, good testimony, be nice, you know, they leave an impression and just hope that, hey, the next person that goes by will be able to get somewhere. But there are times where you have to just walk away when you're giving the gospel and say, this person's not going to get it. But that doesn't mean that's not somebody we need to follow up on. Okay, so if, if you don't get anything else out of this message, I want us to get better, all of us. I'm one of the worst, so trust me. <laughs> I want us to get better at writing names down, writing addresses down, keep a book on us or whatever when we go and say, somebody should go back to this house. And I, we're going to have to figure it out. Now, we don't want to down, uh, you know, downsize on the amount of doors that we're knocking. We don't want to... Uh, you know, slow that we don't want to slow that process down, but we're going to have to do some kind of extra step. You know, maybe my wife and I could come an extra day from time to time and just start hitting some of these doors or something. But some of these need to be followed up on. I, I believe I have a, a burden for that. So if it was somebody that you say, I think maybe somebody else could go talk to this person and get through to them, but I just couldn't write their name down. You know, it's, it's worth a shot. You know, some of the times we've led people to the Lord, even knocking doors. They've told us somebody else was in the neighborhood just that, a lot, that week before or a couple weeks ago, you know, and sometimes those people got saved. It's not that the first person did a bad job. It's just for some reason they didn't get it. Second time, maybe the person was able to get it. So it doesn't hurt to go a second time. We, we're not always going to have that opportunity, but, but if we start thinking about that, I think that would be good. So there's one group of people uh, that we could send another person by, all right, just one follow-up visit. One follow-up visit. And if that person then gets saved, that puts them in another category, okay? And if that person rejects the gospel, we just forget about it, all right? Amen. Second group is the group, we leave the door, we've knocked on it, we've given them the gospel, and we're just not sure. We're not quite sure if they, uh, if they understood or not. Oh, you know, hey, let me share this verse from that last point before I move on. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I don't have a lot of scripture this afternoon, but I want to use as much as I can because this is definitely a, a biblical concept here of following up. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse 5. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers by whom ye believed? All right, so you see what he's saying. You, you believed because these guys were working, but what does that mean? Why does that make one better than the other? Is right. what he's saying. Even as the Lord gave to every man, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Look, you go out as a silent partner. You're knocking on the door. Somebody gets saved. You did your part, right? I know it's natural within us. We're always going to be like, hey, did you get to lead somebody? Oh, yeah, so-and-so got to lead someone to the Lord. That's like the, the highlight. That's like on a soccer team. Soccer is the first sport that jumped in my mind. It's on like a soccer team. You're like, oh, man, that guy's the forward. He gets to score all the goals. Well, he wouldn't be able to do that if he didn't have the rest of the team behind him. <laughs> yeah. They wouldn't be able to win the game if they didn't have a good goalkeeper. They wouldn't if they didn't have some fullbacks and some halfbacks. Hey, man, I, I, I didn't even realize I knew soccer. <laughs> <clears throat> they wouldn't do <laughs> Holy Spirit granted me wisdom. <laughs> it's been a long time. I remember as a kid thinking, I need to be the forward because I want to be the one that's getting cheered at the end of the game because he got all the goals, right? But guess what? Maybe somebody else was a better forward than I was, and I would have done the whole team better if I would have stepped back to be a halfback. Does that make sense? But I want to be the goalkeeper because that's where all the action is, and he makes these great saves, and then everybody's like, oh, man, he's the greatest player on the team. Yeah, but if somebody's better than me at that position, they should play that position, and I should do something else, right, that's more helpful for the team. But at the end of the day, the whole team wins the game. Amen. It's not like, oh, that person was the one. It's going to be natural for us as soul winners to be like, oh, who, who's the one that can really just seal the deal and get more people to pray and all that kind of stuff. But look, that's not necessarily the most important person on the team. 
the whole thing is one. We're all one, right? And it's God that gives the increase. And so if the first person goes and says, ah, that person didn't pray, didn't receive the gospel, forget them, I'm going to go on to the next house. Well, and now if they rejected and outright refused and said, hey, I'm not going to believe that stuff or whatever, then yeah, you probably don't need it. We probably don't need to worry about going back. But if they didn't get it, maybe send somebody else who can go back and talk to them. And if they get saved, you don't have to feel like, oh, man, I guess he does a better job than I did. I messed up. And he followed up and then they got saved. No, we, we just want people to get saved. <laughs> We just want people to have a very clear understanding of the gospel and have a chance to get saved. Know for sure that they understood it, right? They, they heard it and they understood it. And so, uh, so now let's move on to number two. So there's those who prayed. Maybe we, you know, we thought maybe they're saved, but I'm just not quite sure. Probably a really good uh, candidate for a follow-up visit. Now, if they prayed and we... Uh, you know, and you're confident enough to write them in the book and get their address and say, hey, and send them some information or whatever, that's going to be in the next category I'll talk about in a second. But for those who are unsure and you're like, I just really want somebody to go back and talk to that person. And I've dropped the ball on a lot of these. Some of you guys have even told me about somebody like that, and I've just, I've just dropped the ball. But we got to come up with some kind of system where we can not let so, much, so many of these uh, slide through the cracks. <coughs> okay. How, what's the biblical uh, evidence of this type of a situation? Look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. He's writing this letter to, Paul's writing this letter to the church of Corinth, and he's talking to people who are saved. And then he's talking about the gospel. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, Amen. if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Now, he's not, there's no reference in there about somebody losing their salvation. That's not what he's talking about. But he's saying, I re recognize there are people who say they believe the gospel, maybe even went through some motions to lead us to believe that they believe the gospel, but at the end of the day, it was in vain. It wasn't real. It was empty. You know, it was superficial. Maybe they just wanted to say the prayer to get rid of us, or, or maybe they just are really nice people. You know, uh, sometimes you go up on a follow-up visit, and that's when you find out that, that fact, right? And it's not, again, that the, first, that the person who, who led them to the Lord did anything wrong. He did the best that he could. And he left thinking, you know, probably that person got saved, but maybe not. It's good to follow up then, like Paul did in a lot of cases, to uh, churches. Now think about the Apostle Paul. Totally different situation, but they would go from town to town, and hey, we've only got a couple days in this town or whatever it was, and they'd get as many people saved as they could, and then they'd go to the next town. Now you've got a bunch of believers here with nobody to guide them. They don't even know what they're doing, right? And maybe he would put one, or maybe they would send sometimes a person like Timothy or Titus to go back and kind of, lead things up and try to organize them or whatever and then later on they would come back through on another journey or when they're going back back by uh, and they would stop in there follow up let's have another meeting let's talk to these people again right and eventually they would establish a church get an elder and these people would become members of a church so to speak but his thinking was I need to go back and make sure those people got it make sure they got saved number one number two make sure they're being discipled and the, the, and they're continuing on because that's the Great Commission. It's not just winning people for the Lord. Now, if we're going to measure things out, yeah, I would say that's the most important, that people go to heaven, right? <laughs> we want to get the gospel to everybody. But there is more of a job that we're supposed to do. And look at it this way. You know, I could just go out getting a bunch of people saved, and then they never do. I mean, you know, some of them will do something for the Lord, but a lot of them won't ever do anything. I could go back and disciple some of these people and work with them and pour some time into them they might be the next soul winners. Right. Then they go out, and now our force is growing, right? So it's more than just, you know, it's kind of like addition versus multiplication, right? <laughs> kind of like, uh, uh, what do they call it, compound interest. You know, you save a little bit of money every week, that's great, but if you save money and it's going into some kind of account that's got interest, and that money's doubling or something like that, it's not long before that money is huge, right? Compound interest, that's how it works. 
I'm not a mathematician. I don't even understand how it works. <laughs> but uh, you know what I mean. You get somebody, uh, you know, get somebody saved, that's awesome. They're going to heaven. I'm glad for that. But, you know, if you could teach them how to win other people to the Lord, now lots of people are going to go to heaven. So, so it's important, if nothing else, that we go back and try to do everything we can to get these people to grow in the Lord and not just make a profession and then just do whatever. Because, I, you know, I am not of the type that believe, well, if they didn't come to church, you know, then that means they're not saved. That's ridiculous. And I've heard people say that. Uh, it's ridiculous, okay? You don't get any evidence in the Bible from that. If, if that's the case, then Jesus and the apostles were failures, right? Because there are a lot of people that they led to the Lord, that they got saved, and then they didn't ever follow along with the disciples. Amen. And so, so we want to make sure that, they're, that they, they understand. So here is kind of a, uh, give me one of those things here. So here is, a, the, again, send another person uh, to them. If, if you don't think that they got it, send somebody else to them. Maybe the person, uh, this happens a lot, you knocked on the door, their car's running, they're getting ready to leave, and you're doing everything you can to give them the gospel, and they're like, look, man, I, I'm really interested, but I really got to go. Now, sometimes you just get the sense that it really wasn't sincere. That was just their excuse out, you know, <laughs> not to have to listen. But there's been a few times where I'm like, I think that person really would listen. You know, write that name down, get it to us, right off to the side. Why you're giving the contact? You know, that person was getting ready to leave, uh, but they'll listen to the gospel. And we need to put some policy in place where we we'll go back and follow up. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll sit down, like I said with Brother Justin, and we'll come up with something on that. But the next category is the one that we do have a little bit more of a of a process already set. Of course, on any follow up visits, if they get saved then they get put into this list right here, okay? Now, when we knock on the door, I did it again. I jumped ahead too fast. I want to look at some scriptures again on that. I want to, I can't just skip over these. This is the most important part. What's the Bible say, right? Look at Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. And look at verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul depart, uh, departed from among them. So uh, you see a lot of examples of this as you go through the book of Acts. Maybe he's talking to a big group, or maybe he's going through and talking to folks, and somebody, uh, you know, some aren't getting it. Maybe they're making fun of it. You know, you've probably been there. Uh, maybe where one person is engaged and they're listening to you, but they got a family member that's sitting in the back and they're mocking and making fun or whatever, and you're thinking, I really want to get some time to talk to this person and get that other person out of the way, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, uh, and so we see that examples in the Bible, and I think sometimes that's the case. You, you know, you just got to come back. It's okay, you know. We, we can slow down a little bit if it means a possibility of getting another person uh, saved. And so we want to be able to do that. Uh, now, there is a group of people who don't have time to talk who we need to uh, not worry about going back. And I would call that the Felix type person. The Felix. Look at Acts chapter 24. I wouldn't worry too much about the Felix type. Acts 24, verse 25. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a more convenient season, I will call for thee. You know, we get a lot, we get a lot of people when we knock on the door like, if I want to go to church, I know where you are. <laughs> I know where to find you. And I'm thinking, yeah, all right, all right, yeah that person's never coming. <laughs> <laughs> that person's never going to listen. If I need, if I want you, I'll come find you. You know, you don't call me, I'll call you. <laughs> Probably just don't worry about that guy. But the guys who say, hmm, yeah, I need to think about that a little bit. I'll hear you again about that matter. But we need to not forget to go back like the next week, you know, and follow up on them if possible. <clears throat> that would be the goal. All right, now let's move to that last category. This, those who we know were saved, they prayed, they seemed very confident. 
Uh, they understood it very clearly. They answered the questions right. They believed the gospel. Then what our policy is, and we've been pretty much staying on top of this, I believe, and that is we send immediately to all those folks that we get written down, we send them a follow-up packet. And that packet will go over salvation again, in case it is that they didn't understand and we just thought we were misled there, as well as giving them more information on that. And then it also talks about the next step, which is baptism. Explains what baptism is, gives them a, a link to a, a video they can watch on baptism, and then it also talks about why they need to be part of a church and where they can grow and, and they can learn. So we want to send that like the following week, that packet out. And uh, that's why it's very important that we get those names down in the book uh, of all those uh, contacts that we have. Then, ideally, the second week, somebody needs, okay, you know they got the packet by now. Now, the second week, somebody goes by and says, uh, you know, hey, did you get that packet? We did that uh, to one lady here just recently, and it was a really good visit. It was another situation where she was getting ready to head out the door, so it's hard to tell. But uh, it was a good visit, had gotten the packet, had looked over the material and read it. Hey, that's good enough. It's just to confirm that they actually look, got that information and they read through it, right? And so uh, we want to make sure that they got all that. And then ask them this, do you have any questions about salvation or about baptism or about church that I can help you with? And then your goal is, you know, to encourage them to uh, come to church and get plugged in. Then there are those that you will knock on their door and they're already saved but they're looking, and they're looking for a church. Maybe they're new to town or they haven't been to church in a while. They say, I've been meaning to go find a good church. They gave you the gospel. They, you know, they gave you the right answers concerning that salvation. You're pretty sure they're saved. They're just looking for a church. Now, I'll tell you this. I am leery about church hoppers. You know, the people that just they are member at a church for a month and then they go to another church for a couple weeks and they go to another church for, you know, uh, I'm leery about those, probably not the ideal members anyway, <laughs> right? They're probably looking for the best program and the best thing to meet their needs and all that, and not somebody who's really wanting to get involved. That's not, it's okay to send them information about the church or whatever, but, uh, but, but there are those who genuinely, maybe they just moved to the area, you think, hey, that would be a good uh, contact to get involved. Let's give them at least one visit where we take them some information about the church and we talk to them uh, about it and all that. OK. But then I think what's important is to all these contacts that we have. Right. You feel like, hey, we did a follow up. We already sent a packet. They didn't come. They're not interested. We don't want to waste a lot of time. Keep going back 100 times on the same people. And so now it's all over. Like it's a lost cause. If they didn't come, you know, we're never going to see them again. Not necessarily. I think there's one more thing that we could do. And that is anytime there's some kind of a special service, right, that we're having. Now, there's some people we don't want to come. Well, let's be honest about that. <laughs> but there are times you have a special service where you can put out a, mail, a mailer and invite all the folks that you have contacts with, all the people in the book, especially those who let you've, you've been able to lead to the Lord or they stress that they're looking for a church or whatever, and you could invite them to that day. It might be, you know, that would be the thing that gets them here. I've seen people come to the church, man. The only reason they came is because there was a potluck at that day. So they came to that service for the potluck. But you know what? Next thing you know, they got plugged in and they started serving the Lord. <laughs> and so uh, uh, not, I'm not talking about Brother Nick. I know he's already dedicated. So, <laughs> But seriously, if that's what it takes to get somebody to come, and actually start doing something for the Lord is you got to invite them to a service and feed them one time. Let's do it. <laughs> I'm all right with that. So having said that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the great job you've called us to and the mission, Lord, that you've given your church to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Help us be able to uh, see some of, these, some of this fruit, Lord, uh, discipled. And come to fruition, Lord, help us see souls baptized and, uh, and uh, also begin to grow, be discipled, new soul winners, people coming out with us and, and getting involved. Lord, help some of those that we've, we've seen get saved. Uh, just uh, help us be able to reach those. Lord, open up doors that we might be able to do that. And I pray that you'll bless this work and bless your, uh, um, just, have, just 
Fulfill all things according to your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.